ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, uh, public lecture. Uh, as you know, as the dean of the school, I only make three points uh, when I uh, stand up here. My first point is about the 10th anniversary of our school, second point about the Dr. Lee Seng Ti Distinguished Lecture Series, and the third point about our speaker, Dr. Michael Spence. Uh, I think some of you may know that uh, today's lecture is part of the 10th anniversary festival of ideas which we kicked off uh, in September last year with a conference on big ideas from Mr. Lee Kuan Yew in September last year. Our first 20th anniversary, 10th anniversary speaker was Dot Adair Turner, former chairman of UK Financial Services Authority. And then the recent events have included a conference with the Asian Development Bank, a China-Japan Young Leaders Forum, the launch of the Oxford Martin Commission report by Pascal Lamy, and a lecture by the former governor of the Reserve Bank of India, Dr. Subarao. And next week, we'll have Sir Paul Tucker, former deputy governor of the Bank of England, and the former Australian Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, will also be speaking at our school. And this will carry on in the weeks to come for our 10th anniversary. And in this regard, I'm glad that uh, the second point I'm going to make is about the STV Distinguished Lecture Series. I want to, of course, once again thank Dr. Lee Sen T for being very generous in his donations uh, to our school here, and that's why we have launched the STV Lecture Series. By the way, he also supports many other institutions, including the Needham Research Institute at the University of Cambridge, the Bodleian Library at the University of Oxford, as well as other research projects and lecture series at Cambridge, Oxford, Columbia, Harvard, Stanford, Princeton, University of Sydney, uh, the Victoria University of Wellington, and the University of Witwatersrand. So he's been a very, very generous man. And thanks to his support, we've had very distinguished STD lecturers, including Roderick McFarquhar from Harvard, the former Swiss, bank, uh, Swiss Central Bank Governor, Philip Hildebrand, and then two former university president, Jack de Goya from Georgetown and Lee Bollinger from Columbia University. I think Dr. Estini is very keen to invite university presidents to come and speak uh, in his name here. And so we're very happy that uh, Dr. Michael Spence is carrying on this tradition of uh, getting distinguished university presidents to speak at our school. Now my third and final point, I'm going to just briefly give you the bio of Dr. Michael Spence. He's the 25th Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Sydney. And I must confess that I was, I'm going to expose my ignorance, I was shocked to discover that it's a huge university with 50,000 students, much larger than the National University of Singapore, uh, indeed. Uh, he graduated from the University of Sydney with a first class honours in English, Italian and Law. And then he lectured in law at his alma mater before pursuing his PhD at the University of, at Oxford. After obtaining his, obtaining his DPhil at Oxford, uh, Dr. Spence worked there for 20 years, getting, getting recognition for his work in intellectual property theory, becoming a fellow of St. Catherine's College, and attaining a postgraduate diploma in theology, and he was ordained as an Anglican priest uh, also. Um, at Oxford, he served as the head of the law faculty, then the social science division, reporting directly to the vice chancellor of Oxford before returning to the University of Sydney to becoming its 25th vice chancellor in 2008. But I want to quote one something that he said in the newspapers about himself because I think it captures the man. Uh, in an interview with the Sydney Morning Herald, he said, and I quote, uh, there are two stereotypes of Australian vice chancellors. Colon, the managerialist bastard and the academic's academic. He identified himself as one of the latter. <laughs> so on that tone of the academic's academic, he's going to address a very exciting topic uh, on uh, censure and censorship. As you know, it's very topical, and we are truly grateful that Dr. Spence has come to Singapore to address us. So Dr. Spence, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Tina. It is a um, great privilege to be here and a great privilege to, um, to acknowledge the generosity of ST Lee both to NUS and to the University of Sydney where he supports, amongst other things, our very large archaeology projects in Cambodia. Um, he's a man of impeccable taste except in this, that this is the third time that he's inflicted a university um, uh, vice-chancellor or president on you. 
I am not going to talk about intellectual property policy, but I am going to talk to you about my day job, about what you do when academics say things that are difficult or controversial, because it's something about which um, governments, about which the public, about which the press has very strong opinions. Well, in the assessment of the Australian Dictionary of Biography, Professor George Arnold Wood was a patriotic man, and he was a fervent supporter of British Empire, but he held what the dictionary calls the Gladstonian view of an empire committed to liberty and justice. Now, Professor Wood had strong objections to the Boer War, and in January 1902, he joined with the likes of W.A. Holman to form the Australian Anti-War League. Holman, in parliamentary debate, had gone so far as openly to express his opinion that England would be defeated in the war. And that was heady stuff in a colony where England was still the mother country, or even more simply, home. In time, various public pronouncements by Professor Wood, um, public pronouncements regarding the war, were quoted and misquoted at length in what seems to have been a moment of public and media hysteria. And it led to calls that he be censured by the University Senate, or even that he be dismissed, that he be sacked from the university. Now, no one doubted Professor Wood's right to a private opinion, but the Sydney Morning Herald distinguished between his private opinions and his opinions as a professor of history, with the implication that the latter ought to be subject to greater scrutiny. The Daily Telegraph wrote, Professor Wood lectures on history at the university, and is in receipt of a large salary paid out of public funds, which was in fact not true. It's well, underst well understood ethic, it continued, that civil servants should take no part in political gatherings, and to all intents and purposes, a professor at a university is a civil servant. Indeed, even Professor Wood himself, in a letter to the Chancellor of the University, seemed to accept his position as a professor of, pub of history, imposed particular obligations upon him in relation to public comment. He wrote, while claiming the full rights of citizenship, save so far as those are limited by my appointment, I'm conscious of the fact that participation by a university professor in public disputes may, under certain circumstances, tend to affect, affect the position and reputation of the university in an undesirable way. I wish to state that I shall endeavor with the utmost carefulness, so far as circumstances permit, to avoid speech and action that would tend to affect injuriously the interests of the university. In the end, the University of Sydney Senate did not, I'm proud to say, dismiss Professor Wood. But it did censure him. Indeed, it censured him at one point and then at a following meeting amended the censure to render it even stronger. The Senate agreed that in the opinion of the Senate, the statements contained in Professor Wood's letters and speeches relating to the South African War, especially those alleging that Lord Kitchener hopes to end the war by destroying the Boer women and children, are unworthy of a professor of history, are unworthy of a professor of history whose utterances ought to be marked by strict impartiality and freedom from passion, and further that such remarks are highly reprehensible inasmuch as they tend to encourage the enemies of the country and to hinder the establishment of a just and honourable peace, and also to impair the value of his teaching at the university. A more moderate motion was defeated. It read, that the Senate views with regret the speeches and actions of Professor Wood in connection with the question of the South African War and emphatically disclaims any sympathy with his utterances. This history of Professor Wood's been somewhat in the mind of the University of Sydney of late, as there have been various calls in the last year that the institution should censure the view of particular academics. In one case, a prominent public figure believes that the research findings of one of our academics are simply wrong and that the university should distance itself publicly from her research. In another case, one group of academics had asked a public figure to speak at the university, while a second group of academics thought that doing so would harm the reputation of the institution and their capacity to do research in the country from which he came. They asked the university to intervene. In a third case, a national newspaper and a group of politicians called upon the university to discipline an academic for meeting the president of Syria and expressing views sympathetic to his position in that country's civil war. 
In a final case, the university is frequently criticized for failing to censor the unpopular views of an academic who works in the area of international affairs. Now, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. The vast majority of our 5,000 or so academic staff attract little public attention except in relation to the extraordinary quality of their work and the contribution they make to knowledge across an unusually ra large range of disciplines. But we do, from time to time, have staff who express views that attract notoriety. And the public not infrequently expects that we might take action against them, at least the kind of action that the Senate took in 1902 against the otherwise very popular Professor Wood. These debates become all the more heated when it's remembered that the professors causing such scandal both receive public funds and educate the young and impressionable. Well, in the debate surrounding Professor Wood, a number of unexamined assumptions were made that have also characterized contemporary debates at my university. Almost nothing changes. I'd like to consider four of those assumptions and in doing so, suggest a response to the question as to when, if ever, a university ought to take action against an academic for expressing views or for taking actions that are widely regarded as reprehensible. The first of these assumptions is that an academic who expresses a view in public debate does so as a member of the university, cloaked in the authority of his or her position as an academic. That's the assumption that a professor is always a professor, even on the weekend. The second assumption is that the views of an individual academic may be attributed in some way to the university collectively, that they're a matter of collective as well as individual responsibility. That's the assumption that the university believes what any individual professor believes. The third assumption is that it's possible and even desirable for a university collectively to hold a position on matters of substance, either as a commitment of institutional principle or as a matter of institutional pragmatism. That's the assumption that it's possible for a university, as a university, to believe anything at all. The fourth assumption is that it's legit legitimate for a university to take action against an individual academic when her views or actions are in contradiction to the collective position of the university or even merely threaten its interests understood more generally. That's the assumption that a university can and should rein in its wayward professors. When considering each of these assumptions, it's clear that we need to begin with a conception of academic freedom. Academic freedom is invariably the value to which reference is made, in some cases by all sides, when a dispute of the kind that I've described arises. But that's a problem. That's a problem right for the start. The concept of academic freedom is incredibly elusive, almost beyond defi definition. It's been said that there's no clear and widely accepted definition or justification of academic freedom, and no account of the way in which claims of violation may be assessed. Perhaps the most widely stated, cited statement on academic freedom, the 1940 Statement of Principles on Academic Freedom and Tenure, offers no straightforward definition of the term, but something of a mishmash of associated and poorly thought through ideas and norms. Eric Berendt has pointed out that most statements of academic freedom involve freedom, ideas about the freedom of individual researchers and teachers, ideas about institutional autonomy, and ideas about academic participation in institutional governance. But he goes on to admit that it's not particularly helpful to attempt a single definition of academic freedom, and that doubts are expressed not only in respect of borderline claims of academic freedom, as with freedom to speech of speech and personal privacy, but with regard to its central meeting, meaning. Even in relation to questions of an individual's academic freedom, far less as to questions of institutional autonomy, issues arise as to the scope of the concept that have important practical ramifications. Does it apply equally to university officers such as to vi or vice chancellors who might be thought in some stronger way to represent the university as it does to individual academic? Does it apply only when an academic is making comments within his or her area of expertise or also more generally? Does it apply equally when an academic is operating in the classroom, potentially influencing the young, 
as it does to her work as a researcher or in more general public comment. In order to answer these questions and to examine the validity of the assumptions that were so much a part of the debate around the censure of Professor Wood and continue to be so, it's necessary to settle on a justification for any concept of academic freedom at all. In doing so, I think it's important to acknowledge that in order to operate with integrity as an academic community, a university needs to have a clear sense of its purpose and core values. We tend to talk about the university, or even worse, the global university, as having a kind of idealized hypostasis, a conceptual substance that's constant over time and culture. In fact, of course, we know that that's nonsense and that part of the reason that the so-called rankings of universities are so ludicrous is that universities are highly located institutions that operate within different traditions for different purposes and on different historical precedents. The important thing is for a given university to know what it's about at any given time, to have a clear and agreed self-conception. Well, my university unashamedly stands within the tradition of institutions committed to teaching and research in the secular liberal tradition. That's not the only way to be a university, but it is one university tradition that's been particularly powerful in shaping international conceptions of the institution. In his paper, We Need a New Interpretation of Academic Freedom, Professor Ronald Dworkin argues for a particular justification of academic freedom for universities in our tradition. He dismisses what he calls the instrumental ground that academic freedom is about the pursuit of truth and that we have a better chance of discovering what's true if we leave our academics and their institutions free from external control to the greatest degree possible. Instead, he, adv he, he adv advances what he calls, in a way that I regard as somewhat terminologically problematic, the ethical ground. He says that at the core of liberal societies is a commitment to ethical individualism, which insists amongst its other components that we each have a responsibility for making as much of a success of our lives as we can, and that this responsibility is personal in the sense that we must each make up our own mind as a matter of felt personal conviction about what a successful life for us would be. He says that ethical individualism needs a particular kind of culture, a culture of independence in which to flourish, and that academic freedom is essential to maintaining such a culture by creating a theater, that is the university, in which personal conviction about truth and value is all that matters, and it trains scholars and students alike in the skills and attitudes essential to a culture of independence. I think Professor Dworkin's on to something, but I think he's wrong to dismiss the instrumental ground in favor of the ethical. Both are important. I'd argue that liberal societies have found over a long period of the development of the university as a social institution that having places in which both academics and students are free from unnecessary interference in their pursuit of the understanding of the truth leads both to more creative and productive exploration of the truth and also fosters that culture of ethical individualism that's integral to the maintenance of a liberal society. There's a reason why Western universities have been such powerful engines of innovation as well as important institutions in maintaining a liberal political culture. I chose to talk about truth here very carefully because, of course, one of the differences in the two justifications that Professor Dworkin explores concerns not academic freedom in relation to the pursuit of the true, but academic freedom in relation to the pursuit of the good. His so-called ethical argument would support academic freedom in relation to both. But proponents of the instrumental argument may feel rather differently about academic freedom in the pursuit of the good. A live question for many university systems at the moment is whether it's possible instrumentally to support academic freedom in the one endeavor without also supporting it in the other, or whether the chilling effect of inhibiting the discussion of the good also hampers the pursuit of the true. This is the case not least because the distinction between the two is often so fine. 
Well, if I'm right that a commitment to academic freedom is grounded in a particular conception of the secular liberal university as a place which both fosters creativity in the pursuit of the true and the good and also helps reinforce the core commitments of liberal societies, then I think the assumptions that we identified at the beginning of this lecture and the questions that we've ask, been asking throughout become relatively easy to unpack and to answer. First, when an academic makes a public comment, she does so as a member of a very particular kind of community where diversity of opinion and the unfettered pursuit of individual conceptions of the true and the good is especially fostered. The term professor comes as a kind of health warning that the person advancing an opinion is speaking on her own account, however informed that account may be by a body of learning and research that she may be taken to have mastered. There's a tension between this approach and the community's expectation that a professor speak as a, an expert about a given corpus of received knowledge. But any other assumption that the professor, than that the professor is speaking on her own account and not representing the institution that employs her makes almost impossible the maintenance of the university as the distinctive kind of community that I've suggested has such benefits. A university should be a place where the ideas of so-called experts are heard, dissected, and where relevant, debunked. This throws light, incidentally, on three other questions. While terms like vice-chancellor and provost must be treated in some sense in the same way as the term professor if the academic community is to retain its distinctive identity, those terms also imply a corporate responsibility that's qualitatively different to that of any individual academic. It's not unreasonable for my governing body to expect me to keep my private opinions on some public matter of public interest to myself in a way that it would be quite at odds with the commitment to academic freedom of the type that I've advanced to expect the same thing of individual academics. Similarly, while I think the justification for academic freedom offers strongest protection for an academic speaking within her area of expertise, the chilling effect of attempting to define areas of expertise might be so damaging to the identity of a community as a, a university as a community committed to the unfettered pursuit of the true and the good that it's not desirable to play, place weight upon the distinction. Professor Wood claimed to be speaking on contemporary South, the contemporary South African war, not as a military analyst, but as an historian. Finally, though I'm conscious of the moral responsibility that we have to our students, I believe that our primary responsibility is to educate them critically to access the views that they are hearing, including those which we ourselves express that we should teach them to treat the opinions of the expert with only such respect as their arguments and the evidence that support them demands. The student should indeed be exposed to the professor with whom she disagrees, precisely so she can learn to analyze ideas and articulately to advance her own. She should also learn to respect but not be cowed by the body of learning with which she is engaging. The educational programs of the university should be designed to ensure that the student is capable of and rewarded for forming her own ideas and expressing them well. Second, I think it's extremely dangerous for a university such as mine to have a collective position on any matter of substance, at least a collective position that has not been explicitly made foundational in the establishment of the community I mention this latter possibility because I do think it's possible for a university within a confessional tradition, even one that requires a statement, um, adherence to a statement of faith, to be marked by many of the core characteristics of universities within the liberal tradition that I'm describing. It's just as important that the boundaries of the otherwise open conversation are established at the outset. To claim that it's extremely dangerous for universities such as mine to have a collective matter on any matter of substance is not to say that a secular liberal university can have nothing to say about the work of its academics. It can and should have standards for the conduct of the conversation. It should enforce norms of research ethics. It should not countenance speech by university staff or students that is for some reason unlawful. 
It should have a code of conduct for staff aimed at ensuring that the discourse of the university is on the whole consistent with the mission of the unfettered pursuit of the true and the good. As Professor Dworkin points out, that may involve censoring speech, the primary purpose of which is to do harm to someone else in the sense that the speaker has no purpose in making the remarks other than to offend. I'd also argue that it's not a breach of academic freedom of any individual academic for a university to have a research strategy directing its resources to particular fields of work in which there's a national or international need or in which the university has a particular strength. At my own institution, we have a strategy that emphasises the importance of harvesting the intellectual resources of the university to meet several pressing social needs and to focus significant resources on the development of really innovative structures for interdisciplinary research. I'd go further still and say that it's not unreasonable for a university to require an academic employed to teach and research actually to do so, or even to do so at a particular methodological standard judged by the conventions of her discipline. But if a university is to maintain the function in a liberal society that we've ascribed to it, it ought primarily to see itself as a forum for hosting the development of ideas rather than as an advocate of those ideas themselves. If an institution employing academics were to take a public position on a matter of controversy, or perhaps even more so on a matter of public consensus, then it would arguably have a strongly chilling effect on the unfettered pursuit of the true and the good by its academic staff. A university such as mine simply cannot have opinions if it's to retain its credibility as an institution in which academic freedom flourishes and which has the social function in which we've seen such value. Now that's a highly puzzling position to many in today's worlds. If a university boasts about the breakthroughs of its staff, ought it not similarly to take responsibility for their unpopular views? And if the university wants to see those breakthroughs promulgated, ought it not to seek to see those unpopular views suppressed? It's a tempting line of thought. But for a secular liberal university to adopt a collective position on any issue is to betray the purpose for which it was founded and to break faith with the political and cultural traditions that have given it shape. So I will not ask an academic to withdraw published work simply because it's found to be wrong, unless there's been some breach of a norm of research ethics. I will ensure that absent concerns such as public safety, academic academics are free to invite to our campus whomever they think has something important to say. I will not censure academics for visiting unpopular figures or for taking unpopular political positions. I'll not listen to calls from a national newspaper to silence academics but neither will I listen to the calls of those academics that we should ban links with universities in a country with which Australia is in diplomatic relations. The most I will do, the most that I will do, is to remind the public that the views of an individual professor are not those of the university. Now that all sounds very unsatisfactory to those who think of the university as a business, and particularly an export business with a reputation that must be protected at all costs. They tend to talk about reputation as if it were the reputation for being a place in which on the whole, the kinds of things are being, and said, and taught, uh, are being said and taught that a sensible chap would say and teach. But the reputation that I most value for my institution is its reputation not only for excellence, but also as a place of free inquiry. The reputation I most value is that of a forum for the free discussion of ideas of a type that's been such a powerful engine of economic development and a cultural custodian of our tradition of liberty. It's a particular vision of the university as an institution. It's a vision often as unpopular with those of the political left as those of the political right. But it's a vision that for many years has been extremely fruitful and is arguably more vital than now than ever before. As a university president, to be custodian of that vision is a difficult, frustrating, poorly understood, but also quite extraordinary privilege. 
I believe that my university owes an apology to Professor Wood, not least in the light of what we now know about the conduct of the South African War. And it's my job to see that we don't get it wrong again. Thank you. Very inspiring lecture about what um, academic freedom we should have in university. But I, in, in just, just to get the, the, the context right, I, I got a sense from your, the remarks you're making that you're referring to a recent incident involving the University of Sydney, right, about some professor involving... Oh, uh, many recent incidents. Uh, um, we're always being called upon by the government to, um, uh, uh, to discipline this person or to censure that person. Well, not necessarily the government, yeah. but the newspapers, occasionally politicians in the newspapers, um, whatever it might be. So it happens all the time. It does happen all the time. Yeah. And it, I, had, I, I swapped war stories um, uh, with um, uh, the president of NUS this morning about yeah. um, circumstances in which such calls arise. Yeah. You know, the, the, the advantage is that, of course, Australia is, as you know, is one of the most open, the freest societies in the world. They're very lucky to be there. But there are many universities, let's say, in the Middle East, in the Islamic world, that have a much harder time. I mean, mm -hmm. give you a specific example. It'd be very difficult for many vice chancellors to invite Salman Rushdie to their campus, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in that kind. So, what's your advice to people working in very different cultural contexts, like say in the Islamic world and so on and so forth? How do you how would you advise them to handle this very difficult challenge of academic freedom? Um. I have five children and a lively family, and I don't take particularly well um, to people with other parenting styles telling me how to parent my children. So I would only, um, uh, I don't think I would offer advice, but I would begin a conversation. And for me, as I suggested, the important thing is that an institution um, have integrity, um, that the rules of the conversation are clear from the beginning. Um, and I can explain within the, particular, within the particular tradition of political philosophy in which I would locate myself why I think that's important. So I don't think that it's a problem for a university from the beginning to say, um, uh, this is an institution where the parameters of the conversation are such that, for example, everybody has to sign a statement of faith um, committing them to a particular set of orthodox Christian doctrine, um, or um, we're not going to be the kind of community in which um, people challenge the Quran. Um, but I think the rules of the game have to be made clear ex ante. Um, I think where the difficulty most arises and where the university is least able to perform its function is when the rules of the game um, change or are not made clear from the beginning. Great, so the floor is now open. I wonder whether anyone has got any questions. I suppose the Dr. Spence. Please, yeah. Can you identify yourself if you don't mind? Yeah. To Dr. Yeah, my Spence. name is uh, Baudry, I'm from EAI. I was uh, at the uh, uh, University of Sydney. At yeah, I think you mentioned one of the examples is uh, basically two groups are fighting for one particular issue. You know, there are basically two groups of academics, they are divided over one particular event. How would you intervene? Um, the group, um, the example that, that to which I alluded was an interesting one. Right. Um, and that was where one group of researchers was saying, um, uh, uh, had invited some, one group of researchers had invited someone to speak on campus. Another group of researchers said, having this person at our university will affect our ability to do research. So it's all very well for them to talk about um, their academic freedom to um, invite the person. Um, what about our academic freedom to continue our research unfettered um, when in fact the person they've invited doesn't know anything about the thing they've invited him to talk about and um, they're being exploited for a political stunt and all the rest of it. Um, the, uh, 
how I handled that situation was the way that I thought was most consistent with the principles outlined. And that is we facilitated a conversation between the two groups of academics um, who came to um, a con the conclusion together that the best way of seeing both of their work advanced um, and the best way of seeing uh, making a contribution to the issues about which each was in different ways concerned um, was a wholly third set of things, was actually to engage with this person in a wholly different way. And um, that was a great, um, that was a great solution. Everybody was happy. Um, unfortunately, a retired academic <laughs> then went on the national news and said, um, the University of Sydney has withdrawn an invitation to X, which we'd never done. We didn't ever withdraw an invitation. There was a blah, 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 it was complicated, whatever. And that caused a great international media fury. We made the New York Times, we blah, 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 blah. Um, and so these things are always highly contested. But it seems to me where you have one person saying my academic freedom is actually impinged by the exercise of another, the first, so the first responsibility of the university apparatchik has got to be to determine whether or not there is a way that you can negotiate a solution as between these two sets of academics. Thank you very much. Okay. Professor Tan Taeyong. Uh, my name is Tan Taeyong. I'm Vice Provost in charge of student life. Now, you have a very big university, 50,000 students, so I'm sure much of your day job is taken up looking after students as well. So my question is about students and the expression of views by students. And they do it now through all sorts of platforms, particularly on the social media. Um, is a university held responsible for views at by students um, through social media on Facebook and, and the likes if it's seen to be um, contravening uh, a public sort of norms or even the law? And what if? Uh, you have a dispute between a group of students and views expressed by your academics. Uh, how would you uh, deal with this incidence? Um, yes, I mean, I think that's a, um, that's a many part question, isn't it? So um, I think we would, we commit to the right of our students to express their views within the law broadly speaking. Um, and uh, now, we do have, as everybody does, um, codes of conduct in relation to the use of the internet and um, you know, um, uh, rules against internet bullying and all of that kind of stuff. But assuming that what they're expression, expressing are um, lawfully held opinions, the university would not, um, would not intervene in that circumstance. Um, the really interesting question um, is, uh, I mean, I, I guess, um, so I'll fill in more, picture, more, more details of, of um, that particular case. It involved, of course, the Dalai Lama, the, uh, the uh, um, education, someone in the education, the Dalai Lama's office approached a junior academic, got the junior academic to kind of issue an invitation, not quite issue an invitation for the Dalai Lama to come and speak about education. Oi vai, what does the Dalai Lama know about education? So um, he was gonna come and talk on campus. Um, our China studies people said, um, this is hopeless, it's just a political stunt. Um, uh, it'll impact our ability to do work in particular parts of China. We don't, um, uh, we don't want this. We actually did negotiate a solution and negotiated a solution with the Dalai Lama's office where on a model that, we, that um, someone at the university had implemented in Chatham House, we were going to have ongoing conversations around environmental issues and a number of other sensitive issues with which the university is concerned in relation to Tibet as between um, the uh, Chinese government and the um, and, and various representatives of the Dalai Lama's office in Australia. Great solution. Um, the until the great public fury. Now, of course, students became involved in this because um, for the um, I think we had two Tibetan students, but um, they they ended up being great free Tibet rallies on campus, as you might expect, and of course, they ended up being great. Um, uh, down with the Dalai Lama, um, one China motherland rallies against the whatever. Um, 
I figure that's what's a, what a university is about. Um, the, pro the problem with that particular situation was much more interesting, which was that the carefully negotiated um, compromise between the two groups of academics was torpedoed by an individual self-aggrandizing retired academic who went on the telly and said the university withdrew an invitation to the Dalai Lama, which it didn't because the university had never invited the Dalai Lama. Um, and uh, that was then what got um, commentary in the New York Times under the kind of beat up of, oh, the Chinese are trying to take over Western universities, blah, 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 blah. Um, these things are always going to be contested in that kind of way. And wherever you have academics passionate about ideas, they're always going to recruit students as mercenaries in their war with one another. Um, the issue is, are the students being equipped in the classroom with the critical facilities to unpick the ideas of both sides? And what are you doing to ensure that they're actually rewarded for exercising the critical facilities that they need to unpick the ideas of both sides? and that academics aren't involved in the process of narcissistic self-reproduction that so many of us love so much. Yes, please. Yeah. My name is David White. I'm happily retired in Singapore, and I come from Kansas originally. I don't know if you're aware of the issue. Of, uh, about two months ago, uh, the regents of the University of Kansas uh, almost fired a psychology professor uh, for making a personal tweet about the National Rifle Association in which he said, the next time this happens, I hope it's your kids who get it. Now, that was a very unjudicious thing to say, but um, if, if this happened at your university, how would you come down on that? Uh, and this, this was a tweet done, as far as I can tell, as an individual. Uh, the University of Kansas, I think, is a good university, which unfortunately happens to be in Kansas. So, um, uh, so I mean, I, part of the problem arises, of course, because um, of the ways in which we use titles and the ways in which academic, um, academic work has traditionally been conceived. Yeah, I don't think you use these titles, but I'm not really sure about that. Um, uh, even if he did, um, I still think the question is, is the speech lawful? And um, is, this, is, is the speech lawful? If the speech is lawful, um, I do not see how you can discipline an academic for exercising their civic right um, in their, um, on the weekend. Now, you might say, but hang on, you're going to put that person in front of classrooms of young people, and you know now that they have this tendency towards what you might call injudicious language, right? So you might say, as a part of your process, there are more fortunate ways of expressing this particular view. But I would say what your primary responsibility to the young people is, is not to form them in particular views, but to form them in the capacity to form views. And that that's your moral responsibility to them. I'm sorry, I should have added one other thing. The, they issued an edict, the regents did, that no employee of any university in Kansas can issue any inflammatory political statement, period. And so it went, they, they tried to fire him, but they also, did, now it's as far as I know, that's still on the books. Nobody defines what inflammatory statement is. I mean, I, I'm not going to go on longer because I don't want to be on no. the soapbox here. But. Uh, um, uh, uh, these things happen more and more, and it partly happening because um, uh, I was talking to the president this morning about the, the odd thing about my day job and his. Looking, at, looking outwards, the world expects universities to be corporate bodies that have strategies, that have views, that have um, uh, um, directions that have reputations that they maintain as carefully and consistently as Coca-Cola. Right? Um, looking inward, academics and students know that's not what makes a university great. Um, and often the day job of people, of the administrative apparatchiks like me and him, is to balance that conflicting set of perspectives. And in Australia, it's made more complicated 
because the Australian government has started to talk about education as an export industry. So it's also about maintaining the international reputation of our so-called export industry. Well, that seems to me not only to be um, an offensive way to describe our pedagogical responsibility in relation to the 10,000 international students drawn from 142 countries that we have at my campus, um, but also to miss the point about what makes the reputation of a university great. I think universities need to reclaim the ability to say, actually, we are distinctive kinds of communities, communities of the kind of, of free conversation of the kind that I described. All right, within a given cultural tradition, there may be limits, parameters within which the free conversation is conducted, but um, that is what makes a university um, a great university and stick to our guns about it more often. Um, and hopefully the regents of the University of Kansas would not sack a person in such a circumstance. He didn't get sacked, but I think this broad statement about no employee making uh, inflammatory statements with no definition is still on the books. Right? Um, well, inflammatory statements have been being made a long time with more or less the same response. So Professor Wood actually said Lord Kitchener was intending to win the Boer War by killing all women and children, all Boer women and children. Now, there's now good historical evidence to suggest that while that's an inflammatory way of putting it, it wasn't far from his strategy, actually. Um, but at the time, it was regarded as similarly provocative. Can I ask you a question about the job of a university president? Yes. <laughs> you know, uh, George Schultz uh, was once offered the presidency of a university and he turned it down and somebody said, why? He says, when I was in the Marines, I told the soldiers to jump. He said, right away, sir. And I went into the government, I told them, do this for me. They say, right away, sir. And then when I went to a corporation and became the president of a Bechtel, I told them to do something, they said, do it immediately. We said, we go to university, you tell them to do anything, they say, why? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, so in a sense, managing a university is a remarkably difficult job because you in a sense you can't like as you mentioned Coke just now earlier the president of Coke can tell his employees exactly what to do the president of a university can most of the time his employees well, especially the academics would say excuse me I have my own views so what, what do you see as the advice in general about managing universities what's, what's the what's the key wisdom one needs to have I think you have to remember that it's much more like being the Secretary General of the United Nations than it's like being the President <laughs> of the United States. <laughs> and um, that before, You're more Secretary than General. <laughs> but before, you want, before you want to advance an initiative, mm -hmm. you need to understand why it's good and be able to argue for why it's good and bring people with you. Mm -hmm. um, now, not all universities um, uh, in my own city, for example, we have some universities whose tradition, they began as government departments. They have a much more command and control um, tradition of university management. Um, my university rather prides itself on not being like that, sometimes a little self-indulgently. Um, but nevertheless, I think in all universities, it's about making sure that the evidence is there and that the argument is strong. Mm. And in my experience, if it is, you can bring the majority of academic staff with you. Mm. But I, I, I'm told, by the way, just a quick follow-up question. In the University of Oxford, we spend many years. Many of the colleges, I guess, are independent kingdoms, mm -hmm. you know. And the president and has very little control over them, very little say about them. How do you, in that kind of context, how do you exercise leadership? Um, in a similar way, I mean, I think the, what, makes this, um, what makes this challenging in the contemporary university of the big sciences? So um, we've just invested half a billion dollars in a center for obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease that does everything from um, the physiology, the basic metabolic disorders, to the philosophy of government health regulation. If you're going to invest half a billion dollars as an institution, and often big science requires significant capital investment, then you need to have the capacity as an institution to make large-scale collective um, decisions. Um, I think the challenge for Oxford in its highly federated system 
remains how does the institution ensure going forward that it has the capacity to support the big sciences by making large-scale collective decisions. Mm. Um, and that's a bigger challenge for a highly federated institution like that, um, even than it is for um, some of the American Ivy Leagues, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, any more questions? Yes, please. Um, my name is Vu Ming Huang. I'm faculty member of Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Thank you very much for your great uh, uh, presentation. Um, I suppose that I actually have to examine the factors underlying the variation across university in terms of academic free, um, freedom. So uh, you can name a number of factors. For example, academic reputation, cultural or political context, leadership, whatever. So in your view, what should be the most important factor that determine the academic freedom of a university? I think a commitment by, a commitment by you know, the university leadership to maintain the academic freedom of those working within the institution against public pressure. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and I think that is, um, uh, we have seen cases where that's costly for people. And as I say, I have no problem with um, traditions that say these topics are off limits or um, the boundaries of the conversation are such that you cannot um, either discuss these things or discuss these th things in way. But for me, being a community of integrity is about ex ante, making it clear what the scope of the permissive, what the scope of the conversation is and what acceptable patterns of discourse within that conversation are. Please, Professor Wong. I have a rather general question. We, we call all universities by the same name, but not all universities are alike. Mm. So the question of heading a university and setting up university principles, to what extent do we want to consider whether some universities are universities or not? These are the general questions. What is the university and whether some universities qualify as universities or not? How do we tackle this issue because to some extent some universities will begin by saying academic freedom is only one of a number of missions mm. not at all the most important and others would say that is the key to a university and just to, to give it some example yep um i get that so um uh let me tell you what i think the difference between a high school and a university is um because I think it, I think it um, uh, feeds into the question of what our responsibility to students in the classroom is um, and to your question about what a university is. A high school is a place where people learn skills in critical analysis and communication um, and where knowledge is transmitted. I think a university should be a place where students are genuinely required to exercise those skills, um, to hone those skills, but should come to the classroom with those skills ready to be used. Because I think a university, in that it has a responsibility to students for their career, is preparing them not just for the job that they leave, but for the job after that and the job that hasn't even been invented yet. But a job, a, a, a a student at a university should be a part of a research community, not in the sense that she's necessarily working in somebody's lab, but that the same skills that she is being inducted into in an apprenticeship, the skills of formulating difficult questions, the skills of creating hypotheses, the skills of looking for evidence for answers, the skills of using the core methodologies of the traditional disciplines, the skills of questioning and developing those methodologies themselves, 
That should be the same thing that she does in her first year courses as she does when she's 65 or 75. Um, she should be a member of a research community. Therefore, I think institutions that are primarily about transmitting knowledge are not universities properly so called. And that to be a university properly so called, a place needs to be deeply research active, a place for the creation as well as the transmission of knowledge by the exercise of the same skills in researchers, teachers, and students. Um, that's difficult because internationally now, including in my own country, he says with some cautious, lots of kind of glorified high schools are called universities. Um, but that's not what a university in my conception is. Um, uh, that's not to say that I do not think that having post-secondary training institutions whose focus is on education um, is a bad thing. I think it's a great thing. I just don't think that they're universities in what the philosophers of language call the core case or focal meaning. By the way, you know, in your speech just now, you sort of, in a passing reference, you, you said you said ranking universities is not really a very good well, thing. It's daft. <laughs> um, but yes. And, <laughs> and, 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 and I guess you know, as you know, when you when you're at Oxford, you know, Oxford University is very proud of the fact it's ranked among the top ten or top five universities in the world. No, it's just something you have to say. So you travel the world for Oxford, you have to say you're consistently ranked in the top 10 universities of the world or whatever. Mm. Um, uh, heavens, um, universities are in a competitive PR business. If Oxford had the best toilet paper in any university in the world, it'd say oh, we have the best toilet paper in the university in the world. Mm. The interesting things about, I think about rankings long term is the potentially distorting effect that they have on the development of the sector. So, for example, um, AWU, the ranking that people pay most attention to, um, the Shanghai Jiao Tong, oh, Shanghai Jiao Tong yeah. um, has no place for the humanities. Mm. Um, it has no place for teaching. Um, it heavily biases citation-rich areas of the science of the sciences. So genomics research, for example, is much more um, heavily rewarded than clinical research in medicine, mm -hmm. even though governments say clinical research in medicine is most important. Um, governments consistently say they want their universities to climb the rankings, and you want to say, really? Really? Is that really what you want? Um, if I were the Chinese government, for example, um, it would be important to me that um, uh, uh, in various areas, academics were publishing in the mo at the moment in Chinese, given after all, there's a language spoken by half the world, um, and might be of importance in the dissemination of the learnings of university for the thing. Um, that drastically punishes you in our world. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily be saying to the Chinese universities, oh, you want to climb the Shanghai Jiao Tong Index? Really? Really? Is that really what you want? Um, so I just don't, people criticize the rankings for being meaningless. I actually think they're worse than meaningless. I think that they have a strongly distorting effect on international universities. Now, particular well-endowed um, Western institutions will always come in the top 20. And that's great. And you know, I'm very proud of our position on all the rankings and I can boast about our position on all the rankings and I can go to student recruitment fairs and say, you know, come to a university in the top, whatever ranking it is, the naught point naught three percent of universities in the world or whatever it might be. Um, I can do all of that, but I don't think it's meaningful. Mm. And I don't think sensible people talk about them except when they're doing student recruitment fairs or talking to governments. Mm. But I, I do see them in lots of university literature. Though. Oh, of course you do. Um, there are lots of universities. They go, they go along with the um, pictures of, uh, we have a competitive advantage in attracting students because at a particular moment in the 1850s, um, people built a really beautiful, stunningly beautiful, if you've never been there, um, 
uh, Victorian Gothic Revival set of university buildings. Um, it's great in marketing. It's in all our brochures. I don't claim that it tells you anything meaningful about the university. We could be the worst university in the world and have those buildings. Um, we put our rankings, of which we are extremely proud, in the marketing brochures. It doesn't tell you anything meaningful about the university. Mm. So I think please join me in uh, thanking Dr. Spence for coming all the way here. Thank you.